My name is Janet. I, I work in the community with adults who are learning to read and write and speak English. I'm very happy to have been a tiny part of organizing this session. Before the students begin, I'd like if we could just please go around and just say our names. I'm Janet. You're Jory. I'm Jory. Yes. Hi. Matt. My name's Meg. Yeah, uh, Beth. <laughs> Emma. Mama Dredge. What's your Wendy. name? Wendy. Yeah. Eric. Marie. Roger. Adam. I'm Oscar. And Adam. Uh, <coughs> Mike. I'm Liz. And I'm Sonia. So uh, just as we kind of start, we wanted to uh, begin with a little overview. So most of the people in this room uh, have had some sort of relationship with our project over the course of the semester, but different people have had um, different viewpoints. So to just kind of sum everything up, we came together uh, starting last fall, and that was really facilitated by Alan, which was wonderful. And he gave us a book of stories called Dinner at Six that uh, highlighted the stories of um, homeless people within the sphere of the Helen Hudson Foundation. It was beautiful and uh, immensely touching, I think, and really, really humanizing. And I think that that's something that's really been missing from the dialogue about homelessness, uh, from the dialogue about a lot of social issues. And we all sort of felt similarly and began meeting and discussing what we would want to bring to a GISP or group independent study project. We come from dis different disciplines, um, but we all thought that the idea of narrative was really important. And that was just reinforced when we went to the Homeless Memorial at the beginning of uh, this semester, where Pastor Levi said, you know, what we have are our stories. And we came back to this idea of pillars when planning this talk, of names, of stories, of hopes, of dreams. And uh, so over the course of the semester, we envisioned things a little bit differently than they ended up uh, falling into place, which I think is natural with um, any sort of engaged work, because you have to adjust what you're doing to actually make sense of the community and the people that you're working with. So we found that what we were able to do was merge our own sort of academic backgrounds uh, and ideas about scholarship um, with supplementing with readings across disciplines, with building on things that we'd already been interested in. And we'll speak to that a little bit more later. We also uh, were graciously welcomed into the sphere of Tenderloin Opera Company, which was an incredible, incredible experience um, where I think we all were able to be creative, to play, but to engage with these really serious, important issues and uh, begin to actually understand what they look like in the community and begin to build friendships that uh, have been incredibly wonderful. We also uh, engaged in sort of event planning 101, which was not necessarily planned, but uh, over the course of the semester, we're able to secure a permit to <laughs> Roger Williams National Memorial. And uh, in doing that, see some of the bureaucratic issues and tangles that happen in any sort of negotiation of public spaces and knowing that we were approaching that from an extremely privileged place. So we only got the tiniest, tiniest taste of what that looks like. And uh, collaborate with some vendors in the community, Dirks and Say Cheese, um, and Eastside Market generously donated in order to get some mac and cheese for our event. And, uh, to partner with TOC and really put something wonderful together. So we're extremely, extremely excited to, uh, through engagement, show you a little bit more what we've been working on and to really have this be a collaborative experience with you all, just as this gift has been for us. So thanks so much. Yeah, and what I would add is, um Please, you know, okay, I guess we're passing this around. Um, you know, feel free to get up, get food, say things if you want to. This is, um, 
this is an open environment. Like, you know, we're, it kind of looks like a panel, but we're telling you it's not. <laughs> you know, so this is, um, it's not. If you have something to add, please comment. Uh, if you're hungry, get food. If you need to go, make a phone call. Go make a phone call. Um, and we're really just happy that everyone's here. So, yes. yeah. Um, yeah, so I think if we, uh, yeah, I think, I think Liz spoke a little bit about um, just sort of the, the five pillars that we're talking about um, with respect to uh, the narratives that we've been working through. Um, and one of the common problems, I think, you know, a lot of people in this room can speak to this a lot better than I can, uh, that we address when we're thinking about the academic or policy approaches to homelessness is that people get flattened. Like, people get, you know, when we talk about panhandling, right, in the you know, Providence Journal or in academic texts, it's like, oh, the guy in the street corner. You go by in one second and that's it. Um, and I keep going back to you know, the, uh, the homilies and, and all the wonderful talks that were given at the, at the beginning of the Homeless Memorial at, in, in January, where the people who were speaking said, you know, it's, people aren't flat. Right? People have stories, they've got hopes, they've got dreams, they've got talents, and you know, they bring something to the table. And so those are the sort of four or five aspects of identity that we've been trying to think about. So what people, where people are coming from, where they want to be heading, where they have been heading, what kind of gifts and talents and expectations people bring to the table, and um, how that gets put into relationship with the people around them. And so that's sort of what we've been thinking about um, and moving forward with in our own kind of relationship building. Um, and I think as we move forward with uh, today's event, I think we're going to try to, instead of giving a little bit of a talk, we're going to try to do some of the things that we've been doing um, over the past you know, few months. Um, and I think Oscar's going to talk a little bit about what we intend to do. And then if folks are willing, we're going to do some things. So, um, yeah. So we, we ask you to speak now? Oh, yes. yeah, right. Yeah, so, okay, cool. So, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, we just thought instead of introducing the, what the Tenderloin Opera Company is, seeing as we have many members of it, they could, if you want, introduce this space to, to the rest of us, if someone wants to bring that. Wendy was just bragging. <laughs> <laughs> How long has she been with the Tenderloin Opera Company? Good afternoon, I'm Wendy. And I've been with the Tenderloin Opera Company for four seasons. 35 years, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Anyway, two years ago, I can remember I had had a heart attack during the off season. And I had had two stunts in it, and that's where our play was named for. Um, this is a wonderful group of people. We enjoy every minute of it. We kind of, we seriously miss it on the off season. Um, we've worked at trying to get some uh, get togethers in the summertime, which hasn't happened yet, but we're hoping. We're hoping every year, we hope. Um, like I said, this is my oh, third or fourth season anyway. And um, yeah, we just have a ball. Very unusual season though, because every show that we have had in the past has had a love scene in it. And not this year. It, this is totally different and it's, it's awesome. It really is. Um, love to thank all you kids for coming in. And yeah, I know you guys are adults, but to me, you're kids. <laughs> uh, thank you for all you do for us. Anybody else? A couple of words about what we do, Tenderloin Opera Company. Marie loves to talk. Um, uh, yeah, so we get together once a week. We uh, make stuff and make stuff up. We uh, sing songs, make scenes. We, we build towards uh, what we call an opera, which is just the most we can get away with at, <laughs> at any one time. And we present that at the end of the year. But then throughout the year, we, we kind of take songs and uh, we'll do them at the State House or any place that'll have us. So I, I really see us as, as um, a support group on the one hand. Probably the most important thing we do is just check in with each other. And um, then an advocacy group on the other hand that we um, uh, uh, stand up for rights and humanity, I think. That's us in a nutshell. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, well, I think I speak for all of us when I say that Tenderloin was by far the most important and impactful space or element of this GISP. Um, and, and when we were preparing this talk and kind of juggling the questions of what, what is engaged scholarship and what did we really get out of this course and what do we want to share with other people, it seemed like the most natural thing to do would be to try to actually share the space of Tenderloin with people at Brown. So kind of try to open up that circle while still maintaining somehow the connections and the kind of creative energies that are, are born in a space like Tenderloin. Um, and so for the sake of that, we're going to facilitate a workshop with all of you. Um, and the first thing that we do, as Eric mentioned, during these workshops is just to check in. So name and how, how your week went. Um, so I'll start, I guess. My name's Oscar. It's been a pretty hectic week, but I'm really, really happy to have all of you here for this to come together at the last minute. And um, yeah, to you. I'm Alan. Uh, it feels very wonderful to be in this space. I, I worked in this place. Actually, my first office was right next door to, to this room uh, about 35 years ago, and I've been gone from the payroll for about a year, but it still feels like this work I've gotten to do watching this GISP sort of evolve and um, uh, is felt like very natural work and also this space of being here to talk about homelessness and stories and, um, uh, and to have it be a workshop just feels like the right thing, so I feel very gratified. That's what I'm bringing. <laughs> okay, my name is Mirage, and um, I came to the TOC with my friend Barbara, and that's how I got to know Eric and ja um, Jacob and Wendy. Well, I know Wendy for a well, while. We just lost. We got to find. <laughs> <laughs> and that's and um, my um, first my first thing was on the, the Island of Love. I enjoyed it. It was fun. And this is my second performance, and I'm enjoying it. I like it. Beth. Hi, I'm Beth, and my week has been going okay. I think the shot worked. Good. Sorry. One and wrong door. Got very lost. Let's go! Keep going! Hi there. Um, I'm Emma. Um, I work for the CRC just across the hall. Um, and yeah, I don't really interact with GISPs too much. Um, I, I, they come in and out of the office for advice, but I never really get to see the chance to you know, see what, what comes from them and the work that they do. So really excited to, uh, to hear about everything you've been doing. Hi, I'm Peggy Chang. I am, uh, uh, I work with Emma and Meg at the Curricular Resource Center, which is one of the offices uh, responsible for this event. And um, the recent action is an opportunity to come together and be in dialogue with one, one another about the social significance of the work students have been doing. Um, and I guess I just wanted to say, I think this is the first time that an animal <laughs> has been a part of theories and action. So, welcome. Yeah, I apologize for that. No, welcome. <laughs> I mean, we're all animals, but that's a furry one, so welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Anjali. Um, I'm a, a friend of the GISP, I guess, or at least a friend of its members. Um, and I don't know, I'm happy to be here, happy for this weekend's other TOC events as well. Um, what? Oh, oh. Oh, here you go. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tenderloin is our 
hour of release after dealing with the stuff you cannot make up that happens to the visibly poor in Kennedy Plaza each and every day. You watch them get ticketed for things that the suits are doing right next to them, but they'll walk right by the suits and give one of our people the ticket. And that causes them to get warrants and that causes them to be in and out of jail. And this is all thanks to Paolino who he also, while we were di distracted by the RIPTA and the CSA, they snuck through the first passage of the smoking ban downtown yesterday. It has to go through the council one more time, but that is just going to create another in and out of jail time for uh, the visibly poor downtown. But Tenderloin is our place to come and just have a safe place to release and express what we're doing. And yes, every once in a while we have to bring Chico to babysit. <laughs> Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Meg. Um, it's been a very busy week, but I'm so happy to be here with you all and to hear what you have to say. Hi, I'm Matt. Um, I've really not had a good week of got my own issues I'm trying to deal with now, but I'm going to get help for it. But um, other than that, God's going to help me and my friends are going to help me, hopefully, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jory, and uh, I'm, yeah, it's been a long week, and this is a, clearly already the highlight. Uh, <laughs> I'm really thrilled to be in this space with everyone here, to meet new friends and to... Um, watch you all who I know most of you pretty well, know you the least well, Sonia, but I'm um, really excited to, yeah, continue to participate in this space with you today. Hi, I'm Janet. I teach adults to read and write and speak English and have worked in a bunch of jobs, one of them here for a while, and I'm just, I'm so glad and grateful to meet you and grateful to you for coming up the hill to, to work with all of us, so thank you. Hi, I'm Sonia. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm doing really well. I'm really happy to see such a kind of like, I don't know, a bunch of different spheres of, of my life coming together. Um, it's always funny when that happens, but it's always joyous when, that, when it does. Um, and yeah, this semester working with TOC, uh, getting to know many of you um, has really been a highlight of my time at Brown. Um, and so, yeah, I've, I've, I've learned a lot from the experience of participating and kind of being with you all in the space of, of Tenderloin. Um, and I look forward to kind of bringing it into my life after, after this. So um, I want to thank you all for, for that experience, um, mm. for, your, for your resilience, and uh, for your, for your um, presence here today. I'm Liz. It's, it's been a week of ups and downs, uh, definitely. Uh, this has been a wonderful space to be in, though, and I'm very excited that it's coming together in this way. And as always, I'm just extremely grateful for the support that I have felt definitely from my guest mates and from Ellen and Eric and from everyone really at TOC. I'm Mike, and it has been a crazy week for me. Um, all of the projects that I've been working on have had deadlines moved by like 10, 11 days in multiple different directions. And so um, some of that's really great, and some of that's really not great. And uh, I'm just glad to be here with people that I know and doing a thing that I like, and there's food. And uh, yeah, yeah. So that's where I am right now. <laughs> cool. Um, I've had an interesting week. I, I pulled two all-nighters in a row, got a lot of work done, which was much needed. Uh, and then I just entered this anxious state of not being able to get enough done because I pulled two all-nighters in a row. Um, otherwise, uh, this week I'm seeing a lot of things that I worked on for a very long time come together, which is really nice, and this is part of it. Uh, but before we finish this, both Eric and uh, 
cameraman. I forgot your name. Will. Will. Both of you got to check in. Repeat what my brother Roger said. So. <coughs> okay. <laughs> Great. So I think we should all have two cards and a pen. Is that the case? Mm -hmm. Awesome. So we're going to start out with a couple quick uh, question and answers. Maybe 30 seconds for the first couple questions. Just write down the first things that come into your head. So on the first card, the first question is, what are three communities that you participate in? Yes. Three groups of partners. Yes. Three, three communities you participate in. Three, yeah. three families you have. Okay. So now, these are doing shuffling. I learned how to play Uno the other day. Okay. So <laughs> a nine year old beat me to the ground. He had no mercy. He didn't play Mama Madrid style either, though. Nope. No, I don't play <laughs> that. Like two, two decks. We got seven decks. We got seven decks. Whoa. <laughs> You guys gotta play cutthroat. Uno know what it was at one. Definitely seven, seven decks. Seven decks. Maybe we should do that the last week. Right? Two card draw. Just take one. Take one. Take one. Take one. We hardly yeah. ever have a game that gets one. Yes. <laughs> he um. He played super slow though. He played like he was playing chess. Take one. Take one. Okay. Take one. Take that's my dad. Just take, just take one. Yeah, so just take one and pass it on. That's the one that's got real guards. Got no, no, that's not one in that's ever. Nope. Hey, Matt, Matt, just take one card and pass it on. Just take one? Yep. yep. Yeah, did you guys take one? Just take one. Yeah, just take one. Take one, so one of each. So, what do you have in your hands? <laughs> so, on one hand, so you're you supposed to have, have, one have one a roll, and on the other I hand, all well, the things that that person has. Things on two sides. Yes. Yes. You only have one card. Why do you only have one card? They need two cards. Same here. What do you have in your hand? I have a statement. I still need no, rolls. We need rolls. So these are, do you have so many questions? You're coming around now. You need a roll. Oh, right. These are rolls right here. You have a roll. I take a roll. I got your card. Yes. Roll. Ooh, it matches. Yes. <laughs> rolls? Yes. Roll. Did you have the only one card? I think I did this wrong with my combo. Statement. It's okay. We need statements. I think yes. these, are, these are statements. Yeah, I need statements over here, too. Um, this is... Yeah, so who has... But I need to... We need to yeah. roll. Right. This is a roll. All right. Did you get a statement? Yes, nope. there's statements. Are there any more rolls? Uh, it's going to be a little bit. You're great. Any more statements? Okay. Here it comes. It's like, oh, it's just right here. Wow! That might be a little bit. Oh, crap, man! All righty, then. That's what it is. You've got to keep going, man. Yeah? Just stuck in the deck. Oh, city walls. Wow. Are there any more books? Uh, I got this. There's a lot of people in city hall steps before, but besides the current. No, one of the stadiums. Oh. Well, okay. Are we done with the stadiums? I'm holding up the stadiums. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's cool. Uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. That's strange. Everybody have one of each? No. Okay. <laughs> 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 it does, it does yeah, who only has one card, so. So no, I think I did this wrong, by the way. Just okay, that's fine. Whoever has my card. Okay. It's okay. Did you write a statement? Would you want to write one real quickly? I, uh, uh. <laughs> you don't have to write a statement. No, we can work with what we have. We can work with what we have. Yeah. So we'll do a group of four and then we'll do five. Okay. So the next step of this is to split up into groups of three people based on the people that you are surrounded by. And the roles that you are going to be within these groups are the roles that are circled on your card. And then 
it's up to you to come up with a scene within those roles based on the dialogue that is written on the statement card. Okay. Does that make sense? And it can be totally nonsensical. It can make absolutely no sense. But it's just your You have five minutes to do this at your last Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so we're gonna like show you kind of what we mean first, and then uh, and then we'll try it out. Okay, sound good? All right. So the role I have is mom. Okay. Um, I have and the sentences I have. Yeah. Uh, are to stay strong, love one another, and have faith. Um, the role I have is Spark, and I have me 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 me. <laughs> alleluia, alleluia, and lead me, Lord, to the light of truth. My role is haunted house designer. Yeah. <laughs> and my, uh, my statements are, while I breathe, I hope. Is it more of a swoop or a whoosh? <laughs> Thanks for the falafel, as always. <laughs> cool. All right, so I'm a mom, you're a spark, and you're a haunted house designer. Um, and where do we want to start? We've got, like... If you're like a machine that's gone haywire or something, and you're, you're the person testing it out, and I'm like, what was your suggestion? Oh, yeah. Did you start the next Yeah, this is the beginning. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so I'd say so, like, revenge, no? <laughs> well, right now the sounding house, it's not going well. All right, stay strong. <laughs> Me, 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 me. It's not working. Alright. Are you hearing this? Is it more of a swoop or a whoosh? Alleluia! Alleluia! I don't that doesn't sound right, but we need to have faith. While I breathe, I like We need to be more to the light of truth. Thanks for the falafel. And see. So with that general idea. That's what we're doing. But you can like change things to make them fit. Okay? Sound good? Yeah, all right. So first in groups and then we can if wish to, to perform them. is definitely not done. Um, but if we could cut things where they are, see what's come up, um, and then, yeah, so let's see what's coming. If people don't want to present, that's no problem. Um, if you don't have a script, that's also no problem. If you've got an opera complete with lighting and <laughs> that's also no problem. That's I can type that. Oh, <laughs> <that's just funny. laughs> so does any group want to so so our situation is that we're putting on an opera <laughs> and it's an opera about a horrible social injustice in the world <laughs> and we're the singers I'm a soprano and she's the uh, director of the opera. <laughs> So we're rehearsing the opera. <laughs> <coughs> Secret family and housing. In short, we become a dictatorship. Louder. <laughs> Church family, the future. Oh, such great food. <laughs> Wrong and strong. All right. <laughs> <laughs> My family and war, both the U.S. and home, have their upsides. I like both. <laughs> if you are breathing, you're a musician. <laughs> <laughs> Chico. Some other victims. 
Next. Next. Wrong and strong. So you've got, you got a volunteer and a advocate for, or, sorry, not a volunteer, a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> they can have similar roles sometimes. Right? That's right. We have a zombie and an advocate for zombie rights, and we're going to the state house to lobby for the zombie's rights. All right. Wow. The, the state I'm a spark. Two two advocates actually. <laughs> One a little more lost than the other. Okay. And the scene begins. Coming in for a hug. Me, 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 me. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, where, where did my boots go? <laughs> Someone will follow up with you soon. That's good, because I love walking in the rain. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah. <laughs> what you doing? <laughs> if you call this number, you tell them you're working with us for the zombies' rights. <laughs> Leave me, Lord, to the light of truth. That's a great idea. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and see. <laughs> Very good acting. Go ahead. Oh, no. Oh, no. Be a little bit like, uh, yeah. I'll go easy on us. Okay, so we um we didn't quite come together with the scene, but we might, you know. Okay, you we'll know, see what you know what, up. you know what? Here we are. I'm I'm the personification of Providence downtown itself. This is my mother, and we're at some kind of support group trying to come up with a solution to the problems. You've got the craziest Providence accent I've ever heard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 new to Providence. I don't know. Um, <laughs> okay, so. We need to build a community. What does our faith say about this? Pay attention. Stop the war on the visibly poor. Stop the war on the visibly poor. We've got to feed more people. Feed more people. Be vulnerable. That sounds like love one another. Cultivate gratitude. This is why I wake early. There we go. Okay. Cool. The end. <laughs> Chico, what room? Who's next? If anyone. You guys are one. Somebody? Okay. Should we go? Yeah, we might well. Yeah. This decision or moment does not define your experience. Bite me! <laughs> what do you think? I think. <laughs> do what's right for you. Not, not for anyone else. What can I help you with? Go screw yourself on City Hall steps! <laughs> okay. When does this need to be done by? How can we do it the best, most efficiently? Both of you, take some time for yourselves to think this through. Scene! <laughs> 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 Are. 
I think it was interesting that a lot of um, a lot of the advice that you give in different roles kind of can apply to completely different roles as well. Like mine didn't really match, but you know when you, when we talked about it, we realized that you know there were some similarities there. I uh, think, you know, when we first started doing this kind of thing, you start to see how the absurdist can actually lead you to these really incredible ideas that actually like come back and become so meaningful, which I think is really, really cool. Um, like we saw some of that here, we saw some of that with our zombie friends. But um, yeah, I mean, it's just, I think, an extremely valuable thing to do not to mention, it's extremely fun. I, um, I got my own lines, which was interesting. Um, I, like, I, I put my lines down in the context of like a religious community leader, um, but then I was assigned the, the role of mom, um, <laughs> and they like fit very well. I mean, my mother is my, one of my religious community leaders, so like, that makes sense to me. Um, but when I started asking myself, like, okay, if my child, the city of Providence, is having problems, what am I going to do as a mom? I don't really know. <laughs> like, I'm not a mom, um, and so that was kind of hard. But it was interesting to see that, that the faith community leader, like, it felt like the right kind of stuff to say. So, I don't know. Yeah, I also got mom, and um, the phrases I, I, I was reading were very much that of a college mentor trying to let, let the student be free. Uh, but, ooh, Beth, the lines you wrote, um, I, I, I would not want to be the mother of those lines. <laughs> speaking about religion, a couple of things occurred to me, speaking about religion, we meet in a church, and I think a lot of us have a faith practice. I think Matt, I think the Tenderloin Opera Company has like a religious dimension, but it's not out front, so we try to wel be welcoming to everybody. But the, the fact is there's a lot of faith involved in, in the thing. Um, and the other, so there's let go and let God kind of to the right. exercise. You just have to go with it, you know. And that's letting creativity move through you. So it's kind of a religious thing. Um, but without naming it. Uh, oh, and I forget what the other thing was, but that's probably it. Yeah. Well, most of our part of the group are all uh, praise God people. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't matter what church you're in, you can still do what you need to do. Oh yeah, the other thing was that meaning, meaning is something that a group of people decide on. Mm -hmm. So meaning isn't one person holding forth. Mm -hmm. These operas, we make them over the course of the term together yes. by deciding what it is that we mean by finding the intersections between these random things. Mm -hmm. And that way it kind of like disrupts words and mm -hmm. disrupts language. Um, and disrupts categories and boundaries, and I think that that's very a very effective way to to enter into the space, enter into experience, and like lived experience. Um, even though we're like writing things down, it's it's um, it's tangible and like yeah. So it's like Occupy Opera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, together, together we own it. And, and so a more general question is, did, did you learn anything about yourselves either in this practice or throughout the presentation, or more generally uh, working with Tender and Opera Company? I, I just, oh sorry, yeah. real quick, I just want to say, uh, this is what we've learned to do since being with Tenderloin Opera Company, because so far, every single year, the doorman down the street has called the cops on us. So we have learned to take the, have the, you know, the fly, the flyer with us. Right. And we hold it in the cop's face and go, we are part of Brown University's Tenderloin Opera Company. We are doing nothing wrong. So we're actually learning to use the Brown University privilege to keep the cops from bugging us. Because we have to do that, otherwise we wouldn't be able to wait for everybody. Like tomorrow he'll call the cops again. It's just what he does. But we've learned to, and I've never ever been able to say that I've been able to use the privilege of a prestigious university that 
the cops are not going to bother us once we get out of our mouths, you know, Brown University, Tenderloin Opera Company. Once they hear Brown University, they roll on by. If we had said Mama Dred's Mission of Love, nah, we, you know, we would have been moved. But we've learned to use the privilege that comes with saying Brown University in order to keep the cops from <coughs> harassing us because the doorman down the way keeps calling the cops on us. And what Brown University has to learn is Brown University's mission of love. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think they have it. Like, <laughs> look at yeah, right? this. Look at this. Come on. This is the first time I've been inside Brown University. Yeah. Yeah. And it's amazing. Yeah, Wendy's an old kid. Yeah. Um, uh, but we should put the doorman in an opera. Like, that's the next step. <laughs> right? Ooh. Make him sing. Make him sing. Uh, there you go. Don't <laughs> shot with a nerf <laughs> dart. Yeah! So anyway, sorry. We're excited. <laughs> um, so I was thinking about spaces and how we create um, more o open spaces where participants can all feel like they're sort of in it, what they can bring what, what they have fully into it, and then thinking about how feeling unsafe at the beginning, like how to push through my discomfort to sort of participate in this exercise actually made me feel like this is a space and I'm listening to the noise and watching the other groups feeling like yeah, this is a place everyone's figured out how to participate um, in, in this space together. So that was really, for me, an interesting kind of observation. And jumping straight off that, I think, at Brown, we talk a lot about creating safe spaces. I, I, I think that something that Tenderloin Opera Company does beautifully is going beyond that and creating understanding and welcoming spaces. Spaces where whoever you are, you can come in and bring a piece of yourself into the artistic creation process. Uh, and places where truly everybody understands each other because everybody's open to listen. I, um, I gotta head down to the tender line up. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so, right, so I can yeah. drive people down yeah. um, if okay. you want to go. Yeah. Yeah. Can we get a small round of applause for the <laughs> Uh, and 
if people do want to stick around, um, we do have a couple of fun questions about the collection scholarship itself. Thank you. So, yeah. Janet, do you have any questions now that you've seen this come through? I, I'm curious to hear what more. I'm, I'm both sad and glad I, that everybody had to, I'm sad that they had to leave, but I'm so glad they were all able to come and participate. When we were meeting earlier this weekend and again earlier today, you all had a lot to say about your thoughts about the connection between the university and the community and scholarship. So I would ask you to open that up now, if that's OK. Or chipping at the tip of the iceberg. Also, this place has amazing acoustics. I've been hearing myself talk. Um, but I, I genuinely think uh, that it's something that engaged scholars in general think about a lot. Uh, what's our place in advocacy as students who go to one of the most privileged institutions of the world and have access to uh, basically unlimited resources? Uh, and how do we counterbalance that with working with communities who are affected negatively by Brown's actions? Um, I think that this exercise has been really good for us because it has shown us uh, how to shut up and listen sometimes. And the fact that our community partners did ask us to come in and, and also provide our voices, uh, both literally in terms of singing, singing and figuratively, uh, in terms of giving our opinions uh, and working with them, I think speaks volumes about what engaged scholarship can accomplish in terms of learning. Yeah, this space that we just experienced all together, I think, is a pretty incredible summer of the semester we've had and on, on many different levels. I mean, I, th I think one of the things that I've been questioning over the course of the semester was what, what does it mean to create a product? Like, what does it mean to create either a work, or, like an academic work, or within the case of Tenderloin Opera, that it culminates in a musical and an, an actual piece? Um, and what Eric said about having faith in that process, I think, really strikes me as something that, that academia should look sense to learn about that kind of process of creation. I think one of the like real you know attributes that a space like the one we just experienced has is that, that there is no experience of that final product, and because of that, you're just much freer to, to jump in because you're not you're not trying to create something. You're just you're sharing. Right, you're, you're experiencing this moment, and and for our gisp to have been allowed to end in that same sort of setting within the within these walls, I think is actually really special, and I'm glad to have shared that. Um, yeah. You know, I think for me, the, this this watching this um, the whole process of putting together a, a gisp proposal and thinking through ideas and then trying to sort of feel like as the project went along in the semester, we were sort of making the road as, as you know, you were making the road as you were walking on it and had different, as you said, turns than you might have expected. But to me, it raises a lot of interesting challenges about connecting university and academic work with community-based work. Like there's some moments where it just feels like, mm. so I think about, one of the, a couple of weeks ago, we were in a conversation reflecting about sort of engaged scholarship, and one of you said, and all of you affirmed that statement that one of the things that you learned the most from was watching Eric mm -hmm. work, do the work he does with the Tenderloin Opera Company, just watching him, and it made me realize how few models there are on campus where students really get to observe their teachers in their roles in the community, because I think they're not in the community very much. And you know, the fact is that if Eric were a junior professor without tenure, chances are that if he, a project like Tenderloin Opera Company wouldn't get very much respect within the academic discipline because it doesn't. It's not a big production. It doesn't get reviewed by peers or by journalists. It doesn't 
bring in money for the university. It doesn't attract donors or, or uh, kind of notoriety, which seems to be connected in some way or another, not only in theater, but you, know, you can't get tenure unless you publish books that get printed by what people consider to be important presses and how often that really doesn't really connect with what the real needs and the work should be or could be in community. So I'm struck in moving ahead in the future, how engaged scholarship and the GIST process, because I think the students really, you did an unbelievable job of connecting sort of scholarship and thinking with community-based work, but it was hard. It, it just, I mean, just you could have spent the semester planning the event, you know, creating a, this, this, this event, and it would have been rich in learning and opportunity, and yet there was felt the need, and the institution feels the need to place this other kind of scholarly requirement on top of it, otherwise it's not seen as having somehow the rigor, academic rigor, which gives it a value, I guess. I think one of the challenges throughout our course has been in figuring out what exactly is the way to engage with this material, what exactly is like what we can produce that would be beneficial to this community, that wouldn't just be for our own purposes, right? Because there's kind of a tension there between, well, this is a long-term project, right? It's social justice at work, it's a social movement that we're kind of coming into, we're coming into the space temporarily. Um, how can we create something that will be in use um, to this community um, that isn't just for scholarly ends, you know? Um, and I think that we've struggled throughout the semester on that issue. I, I don't know if we've fully resolved it necessarily. Um, you know, we've created, uh, you know, we're getting this, this event up and running for Sunday, which is going to give people a platform to speak their, their truths and their stories about, um, about their experiences. Um, but I think tenderloin has really like just been this constant practice of, the most important thing in tenderloin is doing it, not producing whatever it ends up being. It's about doing it from week to week, being present each week. Each week. And yeah, it's about that kind of re re repetition. Something you clearly produced is meaningful relationships and an understanding of a community that is not one that you're regularly part of. And um, yeah, it was really beautiful to just see you guys be with the people that you are regularly with. And you heard Mama Jones talk about being here for the first time and her own learning and development about how to negotiate these relationships also. And so even though there's not a, you know, there is a product, the event, but there's other kind of learning knowledge, um, things that have been created here, I guess, yeah. And in engagement, it's, it's very easy to lose track of the fact uh, that we're brown students, that we're here for four years, and that when we leave, uh, very often, our connection to the communities we have worked with just gets severed. Um, so something that I am truly happy with from this experience has been we have done a one-off thing. We've planned this event, and even though I'd love to see it be an annual event, I highly doubt that it will. Uh, on the other hand, thank you. Um, <laughs> on the other hand, I think that having gone to the Tenderloin Opera Company, even if it was for just one semester, has created that bond in which there's mutuality and community uh, between Brown and Providence. So people know those are kind of some of the pillars of the English Scholars so Program. Mm -hmm. um, so their mutuality, I think, <coughs> community, power relations, and value. I guess those are some broad themes that we've been thinking about in terms of understanding engaged scholarship and in partaking in it and engaged scholars. I guess. Um, <sighs> yeah. So. I was really struck when we met the other day when you were talking about the notion of presence and how it is and isn't validated by the university. What does that mean for you as students? And, and I was struck by, by Mama Dredd's talking about privilege because we sort of ice skate around it or pretend it's not there. And you all were very clear and have been very clear 
you have four cabinets about this. And knowing your, your advisors, I, I think that probably has been something you've been made aware of and also were predisposed to be aware of. And so looking at that tension, as somebody who's had a, like both feet solidly in the university and then solidly not, looking at the, just the range of dynamics and what I what I learned today was the, just the notion of how it's not a matter. I get I get a little I get very crazy when people talk about giving voice or empowering anybody because people have voice. Thank you very much. They have the power, but but sort of knowing the, the, the how to translate that skill in an appropriate way. So here's the flyer that says we're part of Brown University. Back off, officer. It's very different to other ways that people do and don't have access. To power, and so I'm really interested to see how and if that ripples through. I think one of the things about the work that Eric and Alan do is that they, they just do it. They are present to it, and the university requires publicity or requires some amplification of that work. And so, how do we live in those tensions? Yeah. I think that I think that something. So I was made very, I felt like I was made um, very aware of that, uh, that dynamic of privilege um, in this experience, specifically because I'm, I'm kind of from outside of the discipline. I'm a history concentrator, and I've never done any, I mean, I, I volunteered at Crossroads for about a year, but, um, but I haven't done any anthropological work, I haven't done any policy work, I haven't even participated in the theater group. Um, so coming from that perspective, it kind of gave me a, I kind of was illiterate to many of the, the um, uh, perhaps the, the contexts that um, that were floating around in, in trying to understand uh, people's experiences and connect with people. Um, but in that way, also because I was illiterate, I was I was you know I was recalled back to the fact that I do have like this space here, and you know I you know I, I have a kind of a power in a way um, that isn't necessarily present in those space is present in those spaces, um, and so I don't know. That was made clear to me uh, by that lack of language um, in in the experience. And that that makes, puts me in mind of a couple of things. One is I, the notion of humility makes me a little uncomfortable because as soon as you acknowledge having it, then you don't. I'm so humble. But when you can say, I was illiterate, when you don't know something, you either, I've seen, well, it's not either or, but one tendency might be to say, well, let me pretend, or let me learn a little bit and, and broadcast what I know. Or the other is to say, I don't know, and I don't have to know, and I, now, but I need to learn. And as a learner, I can be open to not knowing and understanding that I have other things, other ways of learning, rather than going to a book, going to a study session, but it, 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 multiple sort of channels of learning and teaching become open to you. Not that they weren't before, but the university doesn't seem to know how to measure that in its... In so in good panel form, I'm going to do that thing where one panelist asks other panelists. Um, so you study history, uh, but a lot of what we've seen throughout this case is history that doesn't get written, uh, the things that are lost in palimpsest of history. Uh, and I've realized through doing performance studies uh, that a lot of that is translated into historiography, reading between the lines. Uh, were you able to bring the idea of that history academic experience in, or vice versa? Well, I think it caused me, it like forced me to reflect a bit more on the concept of memory and how it's kind of uh, related to space in a lot of ways, right? So we think of museums, universities, archives, um, you know, other kind of spaces that are um, hit mem like memorials, right? Mm -hmm. um, and when you're when you're denied space, you're in a sense denied your memories and mm -hmm. denied your, your um, I guess the fullness of your identity in a way and adds a dimensionality to it. So I guess in that sense I've been reflecting on history as a kind of written um, written discipline. It's, a, it's written testimony, it's written memory and that itself perhaps 
it doesn't fully encompass uh, some experiences. Um, and it's interesting to, to think about history because the group that we were working with, Mama Dreads, was trying to mount kind of a history of homelessness. At one point she, uh, she mentioned to us that there, she had, um, there was a statue that was made in partnership between RISD and Tenderloin, or Occupy Providence. And it was that kind of uh, several panels um, that tried to illustrate the history of homelessness in Providence. Um, and that sculpture disappeared. It was in a park, and it was after renovations happened to the park, it, it wasn't there anymore. And they were trying to track it down, but they couldn't find it. Mm -hmm. So it's in a very real sense, their history disappeared. Their, their history. Um, Kind of was it was uprooted, it was erased um, uh, because of its lack of spatial kind of quality. So yeah, yeah, I don't know. Lots of ideas with that history, writing, space, um, um, and their history in a way is kept alive through the the um, genre of theater, which is ephemeral by by nature. Right? It's not spatial. It's I mean, well, in a sense it is, but like you don't have to do it in a specific space. Is what I mean. But um, yeah, I don't know. Do you have thoughts about that as a theater? Oh, I have a lot of thoughts about space, but uh, instead of boring you with theoretical performance studies, uh, I'd like to just speak to how that translated in our a lot. Uh, you say that space is in part nine, uh, and Mama Dreads did say it earlier uh, about criminalizing being poor, whether it's uh, through panhandling legislation or bans on smoking in public that only get enforced if you look like somebody who the police doesn't want to see around. Um, and that was visible to us, uh, visible in trying to mount an event in Burnside Park and getting every response three weeks later, uh, making it impossible for us to plan ahead. Uh, it was evident in hearing their stories about um, seeing 21 plus kids walking around with clothes beer in their backpacks, standing next to underage kids, and getting stopped, searched, and then arrested for giving alcohol to minors and having open containers. You can't make this stuff up. Um, and really seeing how space is contested and how it's felt on, on a personal level. Well, I mean, I think the best example of that is the fact that two members of our GISP are missing right now because they need to provide transportation mm -hmm. for people we're just with in this room so that they don't have to walk from Brown down College Hill mm -hmm. and back down. Right. And when we were trying to organize this, they said they offered at first to walk, and Mama said, no, we can't do that. Like, the space of College Hill that you partake in we, we can't go, we like, if we go up that hill, we know the person is gonna come down and get us. Mm -hmm. you know? And that, I mean, I think that right there is, is everything. I mean, we can, we can keep sitting around this room and we, and we know what, what that feels like to talk about these things. But there are two people missing from this room because they need to drop people down to and, and there are many ways to talk about these issues. Um, and, and the space, or the, 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 the ways that we're called to as students, I think a lot of the times, um, feel really, just really empty. Um, especially today, I mean, we're, we're living in, the, in this time where uh, all of a sudden the world is, is so real, not just because we're graduating, because the stakes, the political stakes are so high. And you spend four years in a space like, like Brown, and you're wondering, what, what the hell am I producing? What is this going for? And, and even within this, we, within this class, we found each other all the time asking ourselves, like, what are we, what are we making? You know, we had to remind ourselves, Tenderloin Auto Company, going to that space every week is the only reason this gift actually happened. Because, because it only took one day for us to go back into the space where we're like, oh, what are we actually producing? What are we doing? You know, every single week it was the same thing, and every single week after spending an hour with MTOC and coming out with the, the biggest smiles on our face, like, oh my god, that's why we're doing this. And, and I, don't know, I don't know if we need a GISP to partake in Tenderloin Opera Company. I think it's beautiful that we're given that opportunity. Um, 
and I wonder, you know, I wonder how, I wonder what that means for, for Brown in general. I don't think that we necessarily have spent enough time thinking about where this goes forward, so not necessarily with Tender Light Opera, but in, in terms of producing together, and, and I mean, I, I think the conversation has been great so far. Mm -hmm. And the Engage Scholars program is doing a lot to that effect. Uh, I mean, we have three uh, campus leaders who have clapped. I, I really wish we could see uh, Engage. <laughs> 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 I, I, I really wish we could see an engaged scholarship component for everybody who comes in through Brown's uh, I wish that uh, I wish that academia would finally value uh, community-driven experiential learning and engaged scholarship in general. Uh, but at Brown University, we have the power to change that. And you're already working towards it, but uh, now it's on camera. <laughs> Um, as far as engaged scholarship goes, uh, you know, I took the uh, seminar last spring and it was wonderful, but at the same time I was reading uh, an ethnography for one of my classes and the author came to speak to the class and it was a great talk, but afterwards I asked him, you know, what his sustained involvement in that community looks like. He's like, you know, I left and I never really looked back and I never even really read my work again. And that was immensely frustrating for me, uh, especially because in this case it was homeless folks and folks with mental illness. And I realized that's not what I want my scholarship to look like. And, you know, it's easy to say that. Like, I just wrote my thesis and had these incredible uh, relationships with these community agencies, but I've struggled myself knowing that I'm leaving and being so busy with how to continue those relationships. So, it, you know, it's not something I can sit here and say on some sort of perch that I always do, but it's something that I think is so critically important. Um, you know, academia is valuable and it's a tool, uh, but humanity needs to be first and foremost. And um, I, I think that's something that we've been reflecting a lot upon. And I think that is something that's been our goal. Maybe one closing comment to, to end, wrap it up. But I think maybe one of the issues with the engaged scholarship mentality is trying to focus on, on promising things that we can't promise. I mean, if, like, we, the idea of creating long-term relationships is really important and it's powerful, but most of the time you, you can't dream for that. You know, like you wrote your thesis and next year you're going to Hawaii. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that's a fact and that's how it should be. Like, and our lives are jumping around all over the place. So, so what are the things that, that we as students with the resources that we have can actually give on a short-term basis? I think that's a different question that we don't ask as much. I think respect and honesty. Yeah. And yeah, well, we have to and, hold ourselves to those standards. And, and engaging in very, very real political processes that are happening around us right now. I mean, over the course of this semester, there were three different sets of legislation the smoking ban, the panhandling, and the roots of fair passes. That's mentioned about CSA. And the what? CSA. Well, wow. the community yeah. 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 All these things were happening and affecting the people that we were working with. And in terms of our course, Tangentially, we were, we were talking about these things. Tangentially, there were products that were created, you know, that somewhat wrapped themselves around these movements. But, but I think we could have spent more time as a class discussing what was actually going on politically. Um, mm -hmm. And that is a space that, that I think we have here, or at least could have. As a way of facilitating activism. Well, the, the questions you're raising, I've been thinking a lot about. Um, just as someone who is not a student, uh, but wor has been working in higher education, um, mostly at Brown, uh, for the past 20 years, and share an anecdote. So uh, similarly uh, to what I just heard you all say, especially um, at the end here, um, uh, there was a program that a group of schools, including Brown, ran for 
20 plus years <laughs> called the Urban Education Semester in New York City. And we ran it in partnership with Bank Street College of Education, which is across the street from Columbia. Um, but you know, students would often say, and I remember one in particular who was also active at the Square Center, Giselle Castaño, mm -hmm. who said, you know, Peggy, I just don't know. I mean, this was one of the most formative experiences I've had in college. Um, she taught, you know, they, the students would, would teach at uh, urban in uh, classrooms for 15 weeks, three days a week. But I'm leaving, and I just don't know. I just, something just doesn't sit right with me about that. Um, but what I came to learn um, through that program, and what I said to Giselle was, Bank Street is the longevity. It's the institution that has the longevity, the relationship in those communities. Um, so actually, the reason why privileged Brown and other students had the privilege to continue to go back is because the community trusted Bank Street. You know? And so I kind of think back to what Professor N said about Brown has forgotten its mission. Um, but I think a piece of the answer to your question is, yes, you guys are not Rhode Island college kids, you're not PC kids who are primarily from Rhode Island or Providence. You're from everywhere, and then many of you will leave. But there's something about, and what Rabbi Flam said about the importance of Professor N being the longevity. You know, I mean, they're, we're the ones that stay, that um, are in part responsible for that relationship continuing. So when you hear that, um, what, 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 what do you think about? Because it is about you and the students and you, but, but primarily speaking, you, this for you was a learning experience, kind of that thing about learning. You're, you're, you have power, you have privilege, you have agency, but you're leaving, right? So this is for you. What he, the gift that they gave you was you were able to learn from them, you know, but. Yeah. Uh, to me, I think there's, a, there's another side or a counter side to that. Uh -huh. And I think sometimes when institutions feel like they hold the relationship too much, then it becomes mm. more about a program I and less about the too, real sure. relationship. So, you know, yep. you and Jury and Janet, we were, all, we were all colleagues together, and we've watched some amazing programs that have been sustained for 20 more years. The, the program at the prison, you know, the Bright program, the um, uh, uh, other programs. When students, when, st when we are able to put students at the center of building and sustaining the relationship, so it's not about a professional who's getting paid to sort of mediate the project, but really believe that students can build the relationships. Part of our job is helping to create the introduction so that that can happen or enough of a frame. Then I've seen students feel like, yes, Elizabeth may go off to Hawaii, Oscar may go off someplace else, but there is a way to make sure you build sustained commitment from other students to those programs, which then I think really creates deep, deep community connections. Even though the cast of students who are in leadership roles or involved in a change, it feels like the connection to the community is communicated from one student. You know, a student, I can say to a student, it's important that you go down there, but another student says to someone, you can't sign up to be part of nighttime outreach unless you go every Tuesday night. If you signed up to do that, you need to be committed to that. And students can say that. And students can build the reciprocal relationships with community members like we saw, felt like I witnessed today, in a way that sometimes institutions can't. I, I totally get that. I hear you on that and I agree with you, but you know, and we're being filmed, so you know maybe we'll edit Edited. this part out. <laughs> um, but um, this is contentious, 
Alan, oh, as you is. know, yes. right? I mean, look what has happened to Bright, for example. Um, what's happened to a lot of the community-based programs right now. So my question for all of us is, um, you know, how do we make sense of uh, what our role is as educators to support students, to um, what is our role as educators to um, the community? I, 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 I'm confused I, sometimes. I, I feel like yeah. I agree with what you're saying and see, I want to say a few things. One, I see my role as being kind of on both sides, so yeah. maintaining relationships, well, personally, sure. just because I right. care, yeah. because right. I live here, I'm a community yeah. member, right. but I also make, make the introductions and then get out of the way. Like, yeah. you know, I think four of you are in this guest because I said, hey, maybe you guys want to talk about this before, <laughs> you know? Um, and I'm also a, a product of Brown. I went to Brown. I did not grow up in Providence, but I came here when I was 17, and I stayed here. Um, so it can it can work that way. But also, wherever you go, you're going to carry this experience with you, and it will inform how you do everything else. It's clear that this has been really meaningful. And so even if you're not staying in this particular community, you have a deep understanding. My sense is that you have a deep understanding of what it really means to commit and to be present to the extent that you're logistically able and, and the deep value that you get from a sustained commitment to a community wherever you are. And so that's, yeah, that's student learning and maybe there's some, some taking feeling from this particular scene, but then there's Eric who's always here and there's us and there, you know, so there's, it's like all of those things are true at the same time, if that makes sense. Can I speak to the, I mean, I, don't really know what your role as educators is. I think it's a very important debate, and I think you both raised really good points. As far as students go, um, you know, when we talk about the organization, I think it can be easy to feel that that's just facilitated by educators, and that's kind of this just large entity. But I think that the students who participate during their time at Brown become the building blocks of that uh, organization. And so I think it just really behooves all of us um, to take that role seriously. I mean, everything that you do while you participate really builds relationships and builds proxy trust until the next students can come in and build that on their own and develop those relationships on their own. You know, it's not just a larger umbrella. Like, that umbrella is made of very, very real people who form relationships. I mean, I think, I think one thing that I would add to that is that um, I, I definitely don't see there uh, to be a necessary dichotomy between sort of the institutional long-term structure of Brown and the students. And one thing that I've thought a lot about while I've been at Brown is creating the sense of community in various programs at Brown that allow students to tap into a sense of long-term place building um, and to feel part of these longer-term relationships. And so, with respect to the engagement of the Square Center, I think it's a lot easier for students to tap into the longer term relationships that the Square Center has when there's a community that students have been invited into and are able to participate in uh, and able to maintain and build and take in the direction they want to. Which is one reason I think the Engaged Scholars Program has been so important. Um, and one reason, that, or one way that I really hope the Engaged Scholars Program continues to develop is to foster a sense of connection between, between the students, between the students and the faculty who are engaged in it, the administrators are engaged in it. Um, the, yeah, I mean, this GISP came out of relationship, right? This was a GISP that came out of relationship between Jory and Alan, between Jory and us. Um, between um, Irene and her greater connection with the community exactly. and right. teaching us. And, and so feeling part of that community allows stuff like this to happen. So when students feel like they have to create something on their own, it doesn't work because they don't have the long-term engagement. Yep. They it becomes extractive. Yep. It's um, it doesn't have the legs it needs to have. But if you've just got the institutional form and the students don't feel part of it, then you're not going to get students who are pulling each other in, saying, "No, you need to show up every week. If you don't show up, people are counting on you." Um, and so I, I definitely see a lot of what's at the heart of this is community building at Brown that allows for the integration of our educational and our sort of long-term place building missions. Um, and that is one thing that I think, you know, I've been thinking about uh, the 
the Doug Leader meeting that we had at the beginning of the year, um, where you were talking about uh, the creation of academic community in the departments. That is something I have sorely missed uh, at Brown, um, and really turned to a lot of the sort of engaged, I love the engaged scholars events. Like I love going to dinner, I love seeing people. And there's a safety in community that allows you to have innovation. Um, and so I, I really do think that any kind of development we want to take, pedagogically, mission-wise, um, in terms of the skills that we're building as administrators or students, needs to be rooted in community because otherwise, otherwise I don't think those links are going to exist. Um, so I'm very grateful for the work that the CRC has been doing to push the Dugs to try to create academic community and for the work that the Engage Scholars Program is doing. The pizza lunches, I think, are great. <laughs> it, it sounds so mundane, but having like pizza for students, but I see that as a huge part of Engage Scholarship is, yeah, it's just creating a context of relationship for these things to happen, regardless of the education that's happening around them. Yeah. I do think one of the other parts is, you know, thinking about Eric and others and my colleagues who I've, you know, watched and admired the work so much. There's often a difference, or we need to be clear about there's scholarship and there's also practice or mm -hmm. praxis, you know? And it feels to me that you can't help guide, I couldn't help guide students to community-based work unless I had a practice in community, in the community. Unless it was, it was real, it was a real thing for me. And I felt like I was learning as much every day that I, that I felt like I couldn't do the work unless I had that. And I was really given, fortunately I came to the Swearer Center. I mean, it wasn't, I came, I was the rabbi, and then I moved to the Swearer Center and realized I need a community practice before I can authentically be, feel like I'm part of this. And, and I was really given the space to sort of explore that and, and develop that. And that's really important. And that seems to me as we think about, you know, which departments ought to be doing engaged scholarship, you need to know that there are faculty there who if you say, so tell me five people and there are five organizations in the community where you might connect students to about the work, they ought to be, if they, got, if they can't name them off like that, they ought to be X'd off the list. Yeah, I mean, for me. It, that doesn't mean they're not great scholarly departments, but it means if you don't have a practice in the community, you know, if you study, welfare in Baltimore doesn't really help connect students here who might want to be doing work around poverty and... That's what's interesting about Brown, though. There's a lot of scholars. Their social justice work actually isn't local. Yeah. And that's a huge thing in the anthropology department. Yeah. I mean, I was brought into the idea of engaged scholars through Irene Glasser, who is ex extremely local in her, yeah. you know, in her focus. Mm -hmm. But I have no other mentors in the department that work even in this country. Yeah. Um, all of my scholarship has been focused on Cuba and Mexico and Guatemala. Um, and my advisors work in India and Peru. Mm -hmm. um, um, yeah. You know, I think, even though I, I do think, I agree, you need to know what's in the community and it's best out of the uh, practice. I feel lucky in that um, Professor Rigu Singh studied heroin in Delhi and when I approached him about the work I wanted to do, was so enthusiastic and was like, okay, like, you know, rely on Irene for, for this because she's gonna be able to tell you what's here and I can give you all this scholarship and I wanna hear what you have to say so that we can actually create this sort of cross-cultural communication, which was great. So I, I think that, you know, if you are gonna be elsewhere, which is just sort of the, what happens sometimes, you have to be ready to collaborate. I think there's one last piece of the puzzle that we're, we're kind of skipping over in this conversation. I think it's the crucial piece. And that, that we, as students or people who are interested in these questions, are perhaps the only ones who will be able to tackle this. It's the, question, it's the fact that Brown, as an institution, is not single. We, have, we all know that. Like, it's an incredibly pluralistic space with all of these different bureaucracies and people and actors engaging with the community. And once you start to break that down, you realize like there is no more community because DPS officers live in Providence or they live in Cranston, and they come to work here and they bring in their own conceptions to this space. And at the same time, there are people living outside of these walls who still see that as a single thing. And we're placed in an unbelievable space to be able to actually look at that from the inside and start to understand who are those actual people. You know, I've spent three years with the Food Recovery Network trying to explain to Brown Dining Services that they throw out 
a huge amount of food and it would be really easy to, instead of putting it in a dumpster, just bring it to a shelter because it's perfectly edible. And these aren't people, these aren't scholars. They're people wrapped up in a bureaucracy that happens to have the Brown name attached to it. But what does engaged scholarship look like when it looks back at Brown? Because that's really what you need to start to deconstruct. Because the relationships we're talking about are already there. Like we, we know people doing incredible work at Brown, we know people doing incredible work in other communities, but I don't really think that that is the focus. And again, Mama Judd's couldn't come up here because a Brown police officer wouldn't let her come up here. I know someone who, who was lying bloody in the streets because he'd gotten into a fight and a Brown police officer thought that he was a student and the second he realized he wasn't a student, just drove his car away and left him there. I think those are really the systems that need to be tackled. Uh, being the, the time facilitator, I, 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 I would like to, first of all, thank everybody for being here. Certainly thank you all for this. And maybe just very quickly ask if we want to just go down the line, if you want to, if there's anything else you'd like to add before we leave. I don't know. <laughs> we really kind of uh, came to culminating points and culminating questions. And I've really enjoyed this this exchange, um, especially from kind of you know within the group, but also outside the outside certain disciplines. Um, so I, yeah, thank you to everyone. Thank you, Alan. Um, thank you, Janet. Um, thank you, Jory. Um, and thank you, all of you. Um, yeah, I don't know if that's what I have to say. Um, I have a charge to everybody here, and it's already something that most of us do. But be present. Uh, whatever you do, however you get engaged, and this is not only community engagement, it's scholarly engagement, it's uh, engagement with your friends. Be there, don't, don't be the person who's getting one day out of the other. And the first step to that is come to Berkeley <laughs> Mac. <laughs> um, how did it in West Africa's classroom? Um, yeah, it's been a really special talk. This is the wonderful, and uh, if I can just speak for a second to my own um, path going forward, I mean, I'm working with Teach for America, which is another organization that's kind of notorious for building those relationships and leaving. So um, I think, you know, at the Swear Center, at, uh, in my own life, and like through TFA, Approaching all those relationships with respect and honesty is so important and constantly interrogating what your presence looks like and the impact it leaves on the community. Um, I just, yeah, th thank you very much to everybody who was here. Also, I think it's important to look around the room and realize we've got, you know, note cards over the place, people are sitting in chairs and aren't in the places they started. Uh, you know, like, this is clearly not a normal. Um, there's a dog. Right, there's a dog there in is. here an hour ago. Um, and so, thank you for tolerating the disruption of the <laughs> academic space. Um, I think that that is something that we have to acknowledge when we do any kind of community engaged work is that the expectations that we bring as academics to even what kind of creatures are allowed in our rooms <laughs> is going to have to change. Um, and maybe there were better ways that we could have organized this event. Maybe not. Um, and just thank you for going through with it with us. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm happy to be involved in these conversations. So um, I'm grateful for having been brought into them. So thank you. Thank you all.